Great. I'm going to um, start us off here today. So welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Harry Cortepina. I am Director of Research and Engagement here at IPPR, and we're delighted to welcome you here today for a conversation which forms part of um, IPPR's flagship uh, Better Health and Care programme. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to see so many people joining us for today's conversation, although I'm not particularly surprised because the topic for today's conversation um, couldn't be more timely and relevant. Um, the pandemic, as everyone will know, has exposed just how fragile our society and also our health and care system is and how uh, exposed to shocks and in particular COVID-19 at the moment um, but in future, a whole raft of other shocks, potentially, uh, including climate change, uh, AMR and others, could uh, uh, hit the, the, the NHS, uh, social care and our society and the challenges that poses to us as a, as a society. So um, we are delighted today to be having a conversation about how we respond to COVID-19 um, in terms of making our health and care systems and our society stronger and more resilient. Um, and what a more resilient health and care system might look like in the future. Um, and to help us to uh, uh, investigate that question, we've got an amazing panel of speakers. So firstly, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome today uh, the Shadow Health and Care Secretary, uh, John Ashworth, MP. Um, and we also will then hear responses from uh, Dr. Tallulah Omi, who's public health physician, urban uh, epi epidemiologist and founder of uh, Urban Better, and of course, Dr. Claire Wenham, Assistant Professor of Global Health Policy at the London School of Economics. And then finally, our very own Chris Thomas, who um, leads our Better Health and Care programme. So um, a, a wonderful lineup of speakers for you today. Um, we will kick off in just a moment with John's uh, opening remarks. Um, but I just wanted to flag uh, a few uh, housekeeping things. Um, if you could put any questions throughout the session in your Q&A, that would be great in the Q&A function and we will read them out. Um, once questions start popping up, you can uprate them by liking them um, and the most popular ones we will make sure get asked. Um, uh, if you could also just be aware that there is um, that the, the session is being recorded. There's also um, media um, in the session, so um, some of the remarks may well be uh, uh, in the press as well. So just be aware um, that that that's the context for today's event. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to to John Ashworth to kick us off. Well, thank you very much. Uh... Harry, and thank you so much to the IPPR putting on this webinar about this incredibly important issue. And can I say I'm really excited and pleased to be on a virtual platform with Tallulah and Claire, both of whom whose work I have followed closely throughout this, throughout this crisis. And I'm really looking forward to what they will be saying, which I know will be of uh, tremendous insight. And I'm sure everybody watching the webinar will find incredibly useful. Now, a year ago, Boris Johnson told us our country remains extremely well prepared as it has been since the outbreak began in Wuhan several months ago. But the truth is COVID-19 has revealed our government as unprepared, complacent and inept with devastating consequence. Over, over 120,000 have died. Our NHS staff are exhausted and face a pay cut. Kids have lost months of education. Families are worn out, anxious, and face tax rises. We're suffering a deep economic hit with the young, with women, uh, those from minority ethnic communities, and the poor affected the most. It didn't have to be like this. A healthier, more equal society would have weathered the storms better. We should have planned better, acted more quickly, and responded more comprehensively. This isn't about the benefit of hindsight. While the specifics of any single pandemic are unknowable, the fact of them is known, as are the steps countries need to take to prepare. In a famous TED lecture in 2015, Bill Gates observed, if anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war, not missiles, but microbes. For years, the EcoHealth Alliance warned that specific bat origin coronaviruses are at high risk of being the next pandemic. In 2018, the World Health Organization said coronaviruses pose major public health risks. 
in our global and populous world, we are, as experts like Anthony Fauci have said, in an era of pandemics. Future outbreaks of new infectious diseases are likely. Viruses even more deadly or contagious than COVID-19 could emerge. Future resilience against pandemics and health security isn't a choice, it's a necessity. But despite pandemic threat being flagged on the Cabinet Office Risk Register for years, the UK was and crucially remains unprepared. Years of cuts to public services on austerity left our health and care services lacking the capacity needed when disaster struck. Public health funding has been slashed since 2020, uh, 2010. Health inequalities have widened. COVID hit a population with millions of people in poor health, in poor housing, and with job and income insecurity. While our world leading scientific community have led in COVID treatment trials, vaccine development and genomic sequencing, we must now rebuild our public health capability to match our scientific one. In March 2020, no independent public health expert sat on stage. Instead of preventing infection in the first place, the UK based its strategy on avoiding overload in the NHS. Lack of testing and tracing meant we were way behind the exponential growth curve locking down weeks too late to avoid a severe first wave. So we had a failure of decision-making at the top of government, but we lacked capacity too. The NHS entered the crisis short of 100,000 staff, including 40,000 nurses. We had fewer acute beds than, than 10 years ago. Our PPE stockpile had dwindled. Operations were canceled. Treatments de delayed to prevent our NHS from collapsing but a strategy based on the fundamentals of public health and prevention would have meant we didn't have to choose between COVID care and cancer care. Our lack of preparedness was most evident in public health. Protecting the public means putting public health at the center of policy, all policy, but years of health cuts, public health cuts, left local services reduced and overstretched. Yet once in an epidemic, it's local public health professionals who are trained in the techniques of disease containment and, should, and who should be leading the response. They should have been resourced from the start to do case finding and the retrospective and forward contact tracing that hunts down and breaks onward chains of infection, as happened successfully in South Korea, in Taiwan and Vietnam. Instead, the government spent billions on private sector alternatives who are less effective than the experts rooted in communities on the ground. And scandalously, those who are sick or who need to isolate still aren't given adequate financial recompense to do so. A fundamental failing of test and trace, highlighted by its own head, Dido Harding, just a few weeks ago. We are a rich country, but with millions of our citizens walking a tightrope of just about getting by, COVID knocked them off that tightrope. It hit incomes. It spread easily in public facing workspaces, crowded factories and overcrowded housing. It caused severe disease, particularly in those with pre-existing chronic illness. Michael Marmot's work has shown how 10 years of austerity with poor housing, food insecurity, lack of green space, insecure income has given us deteriorating population health, increasing health inequality and falling life expectancy. That's meant in this crisis, our poorest communities paid for years of austerity and public health spending cuts with their lives and livelihoods. It is unforgivable that so many were left so exposed. How much more unforgivable is it now to refuse to invest heavily in public health for the future? Investing in public health and narrowing health inequity is a mission of mine. It is the lodestar that guides me. Population, health and well-being must be at the centre of all policies in government. Now, we can't precisely predict which disease will take off next or when, but we do know it will come. In the last hundred years, we've experienced flu pandemics, the emergence and spread of HIV AIDS, Ebola, SARS, MERS, Nipah virus, Zika virus. The majority of emerging diseases and almost all known pandemics are, called, are caused by uh, zoonosis, but my, our zoonosis caused by microbes of animal origin that spill over, jumping from animal to human and often back again. And this is happening with increasing frequency. 
from environmental degradation and biodiversity loss, deforestation, land use change, to exploitation of wildlife. All these bring humans into greater contact with wild animals, creating the conditions for increased pathogen transmission between humans and animals. Expansion of poultry and pig production in Southeast Asia led to repeated influenza outbreaks. The Nipah virus, a very dangerous virus, originating in fruit bats, infecting pig farms in uh, Malaysia and spreading to Singapore. Coronaviruses originated in bats causing SARS, MERS, COVID-19, driven by expansion of human settlements and exploitation of wildlife. The recent Intergovernmental Council on Pandemic Prevention estimate there are hundreds of thousands of viruses that could infect humans. They warn five new diseases emerge in people every year, any one of which could become the next pandemic. Once human to human transmission is established, a highly connected world ensures increasingly rapid spread. And climate change with increases in temperature increased, and increased rainfall is already causing species migration, widening the potential distribution of disease. I mean, for example, the movement of certain species of mosquitoes is estimated to expose 1 billion new people to diseases, including dengue fever, yellow fever and, e and Zika by the end of the century. So combined with the current unprecedented rate of biodiversity loss, as humans expand across the planet, we are becoming ever more exposed to the emergence of new diseases. And given COVID-19 has already cost the world or is costing the world uh, uh, 2.6, has cost the world 2.6 million lives and is estimating to cost the world $28 trillion, $28 trillion costing the UK economy billions of pounds. This can be no time for complacency. So what further action do we need to take? The first action is implementing our core commitment to public health, to build a resilient, healthier and fairer society at home and supporting others to do so abroad. Secondly, given we know now and understand the dangers of environmental exploitation in driving zoonotic spillovers, tackling climate change and biodiversity loss with a green recovery from, COVID, from the COVID crisis is more urgent than ever. It's key to building health security. As today, the Preventing Future Pandemics Co Coalition warn, we must invest in global infrastructure uh, needed for prevention. They are right. So this requires leadership at the G7, the COP26 and G20, internationally forming alliances to make the world a safer place for the future. Next, science remains a cornerstone of a successful future. The World Health Organization prioritizes a number of pathogens for further research, including coronaviruses, Ebola, Lassa, Nipah, Zika, and Rift Valley fever. So from genomic sequencing to surveillance systems, from world-beating epidemiological and mathematical models to developing life-saving life vaccines and therapeutics, we need continuing investment and partnerships between industry, research institutions, and government. The mRNA vaccine advances are hugely exciting and we're pleased to see the target to develop new vaccines in 100 days. If successful, countless, countless lives should be saved in the future. But as Peter Hotes from the National School of Medicine in the, in the US rightly argues, success for, ac access to scientific innovation is inherent to the concept of universal health co coverage. We have a responsibility, therefore, to challenge so-called vaccine nationalism and ensure fair distribution of COVID vac vaccines. For me, not only is that morally right, but to be frank, none of us will be safe until all are safe. So it's vital to reduce the chance of further vaccine res resistant mutations too. Secondly, we need viral discovery through international coordinated surveillance and sequencing. We need a global alert system to spot outbreaks quickly. Our government has offered genomic sequencing to the world to identify further COVID-19 variants. I welcome, I welcome that but we need to support the science with international agreements on shared benefit. We all remember how in 2007, Indonesia blocked data sharing about avian flu when they were denied access to a vaccine developed using the strain they had provided to the surveillance network. So getting clear agreements in place must be a task for the G20 and G7 later this year. Finally, I started my remarks observing how warnings were ignored and senior politicians slow to respond. We can't ever allow that to happen again. 
The new National Institute for Health Protection and ministers have responsibilities for pandemic preparedness. These plans should be independently assessed by an outside body, an OBR style process for health resilience and security, if you like. And as Secretary of State for Health, I would report to Parliament annually on pandemic preparedness, placing the public health and well-being at the heart of everything I do and outlining how, how we'll build a more resilient country to reduce inequality, to invest in science and to build a greener, safer future. Governments rightly invest in defence planning and war games. Practising for pandemics should be no different. Ministers should germ game on an annual basis to prepare themselves and the country for the next pandemic or infectious outbreak. Never again should we have ministers ignoring the science and learning on the job. The emergence of new diseases may seem like random bad luck and the death tolls from consequent pandemics inevitable, but they are not just bad luck and devastating spread is not inevitable. We can reduce the chance of new crossover diseases by tackling biodiversity loss, climate change and poverty. We can support healthier populations. We can respond effectively, reducing the opportunities for spread, illness and death. These are within our control. We were not ready for this pandemic, but through rebuilding our society, investing in science and working internationally, we can be ready for the next one. Thank you. Thanks, John, for that. That was really um, interesting and uh, insightful uh, and very timely intervention. Um, before we come to the rest of the panel, and I, and I will come to the panel in a second, um, there is uh, one question from the media that I'd like to, to put to you, if that's OK, John. Um, so Dave West from the HSJ says, the statutory independence of NHS England since 2013 has arguably enabled it to set a more independent assessment of the resources it needs and given it stronger negotiating basis to do so. Um, so we're thinking here of uh, behind the scenes uh, and public engagement such as the five year forward view and speeches by Sam Stevens. Um, this may be curbed by the government's proposed power grab over NHS England, um, taking stronger powers of direction, setting the mandate, etc. Yet the changes that arguably bring more democratic accountability via the government to the NHS. Do you support or oppose these moves and how do they fit with the idea of a more resilient NHS in the future? Well, first of all, we've not seen the legislation, uh, although we anticipate it later this year in the next uh, 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 Queen's speech. But the, the, the independence of Simon Stevens has clearly been uh, uh, in, in uh, his independence and ability to speak out has clearly been important. He has just today, for example, pointed out that the NHS did budget for a 2.1% increase in NHS staff's wages, therefore confirming that Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak are attempting to cut NHS staff's wages uh, in real terms. Uh, we will study the legislation uh, uh, carefully, but I do think it is curious that the, the areas where we've seen success in this pandemic the rollout of the vaccination program, for example, uh, uh, the, the Nightingale hospitals is because of the NHS. The areas where we've seen failures have been the direct responsibilities of the Secretary of State. The failures to procure PPE uh, appropriately, uh, the failures on uh, test and trace. I think many of these issues will come to the fore in the debate on the legislation, which we anticipate in the summer. Thank you very much, John. Um, so if I go next to um, Dr. Tallulah um, Oni for your views on the resilience of, of the health and care system and the global health system as well. Thanks, Harry. And thank you uh, to the keynote speaker for that really insightful um, introduction to, to the issue and really quite comprehensive. I'm a public health uh, physician, so I come at it very much from a systems-based approach, and I tend to focus as an urban epidemiologist on the ways in which we could um, understand how different aspects of our environment um, and, and factors beyond the individual uh, impact and on, 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 on health. So the first thing I, I want to talk about is just thinking about the notion of resilience itself. And then I'll touch a little bit on 
on, on different aspects of exposure, vulnerability and access to care. Um, and then I'll just end with thinking about what a, a response, what I think an, an important response system would comprise. So firstly, in terms of resilience, I think the reality is that uh, many of these shocks and stressors that drive um, the kind of acute uh, health emergencies that we're seeing now with COVID or more protracted emergencies like we see with climate change, it's important that we recognize that these, a lot of these arise out of intentional choices um, across sectors from local to global. And I say that because then in thinking about building resilience, um, obviously, adaptation to cope with those shocks and stressors is, is vital, but that can't be the end point because instead we have to confront, or in addition rather, we have to confront the upstream choices and decisions we make that in fact weaken our resilience by driving our system towards um, a more propensity for disease and ecological disruption, as the keynote speaker highlighted. And so when we think about building resilient systems, um, we need to focus on strengthening the ability of those systems. So on one hand, preparing for the unavoidable, but really critically intervening to prevent the preventable. And one outcome I hope will come out of this epidemic is that, or pandemic, is that we embrace a systems for health approach. That when we talk about health emergencies, we're not just talking about healthcare systems, but that we take a systems for health approach. We know that the majority of factors that influence health over 80% of factors that influence health lives are the healthcare system. A healthcare system, obviously, really vital um, to, to protecting health, but that the, the systems for health approach is really vital to building the population resilience. Uh, so, if, take for example, of the differential exposures and vulnerability and access to care that, that we've seen um, that has played out with, um, with the pandemic. So, for example, with exposure, we know that one of the most um, the highest uh, places uh, where we see the most transmission is within households, right? And we know that housing inequality has been, um, is, is a perennial, um, a long, long standing problem. We know that exposure to um, certain housing conditions have significant impacts on, on health. There've been studies done in, a study done in Wales a few years ago that found um, that significant upgrades to social housing had um, significant um, reductions, resulted in significant reductions in emergency hospital admissions ten, up to 10 years later. So this is something that we don't see because we tend to separate uh, certain exposures like housing from actually health, health outcomes. So really vital that we think about those kinds of exposures. Vulnerability, I want to focus on obesity, particularly um, with the relevance of this, this country. Um, we know, um, so the World Obesity Federation recently uh, published uh, an atlas that showed that globally at the end of uh, 2020 last year, mortality from COVID was more than 10 times higher in countries where the overweight prevalence um, exceeded 50% of adults compared to those with lowest, and that's just overweight. We know that countries where populations are less physically active and consume more ultra processed foods were more likely to have higher mortality. We know that physical activity can reduce um, that, um, that risk and in increase um, re resilience. But do we think about uh, building health resilience, when we think about building health resilience, do we, do we center how we develop our urban spaces around um, as being really vital to building that resilience? Right, so that that's kind of those are the kinds of. Oh, we also know that increased COVID mortality was associated with increased consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. We know in this country we see, and and this is research that colleagues of mine have done in, in Cambridge, the clustering of um, uh, takeaway and fast food restaurant. Um, outlets in areas of high deprivation. So when we talk about addressing obesity, we have to go beyond the individual. Uh, we have to look at the environment. The healthy choice has to be the easy choice for everyone. We have to look at how, um, how uh, accommodating and how accessible these things are and make sure that it's fair in that context. And lastly, in terms of access to care, um, we, we have the NHS and it's free um, to use at the point of service, but we also know that people experience differential levels of care. You know, there was 
there, there were re was research done before the pandemic that showed amongst even older people, ethnic minority groups are more likely to, re to, to um, report poorer treatment in, in the health system. And that has knock on effects on, on, on health seeking behavior. There was re um, research published today that showed that um, cardiovascular outcomes um, in the last year have been poorer in ethnic minority groups. And this hypoth hypothesized that relates to delays in seeking health care. So at the same time as having a, 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 an incredible health system that needs um, more investment, we also have to be tuned in to the nuance of who is who is still being excluded. Um, the health, health and the economy have been pitted as this dichotomy over the last year, which is simply untrue. You know, we know that um, addressing the uh, health and building population health resilience is so critical to to a uh, um, to a to a successful economy uh you know we know going back to the obesity example you know almost 30 percent of covid related um uh hospitalizations could be attributed to overweight or obesity right and the implications of that for 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 the economy um uh, particularly in recognizing that that's not equally distributed across across the country um and across all population groups is vital so i'll end with this and thinking about our response strategy um Firstly, highlighting the importance of, in the middle of the emergency, thinking about an emergency versus a sustained response. And I call that emergency foresight. So when we're talking about learning from our mistakes, we often, or learning as we go, not necessarily even from our mistakes, we often think about it as something that happens afterwards. And I would argue that that's actually something that needs to happen in the middle of the crisis. So we talk about, and we've spoken, has already been spoken about in terms of preparedness. I would, I'd like to um, highlight three things. The early response system, so the importance of tailoring the responses to the realities of inequalities in this exposure, vulnerability, and access. The importance of systematic and systemic, integ uh, system systemic integrated response across these systems for health and not siloed to the healthcare system. And really vital to that, the importance of real-time disaggregated data by age, by gender, by ethnicity, recognizing in order to pick up early where, um, where our response might be failing. The second is important, and the last two points I make and are not very, um, are not um, official parts of emergency response, but I think are so vital. So the importance of an early learning system. So how are we learning in real time? What are we understanding about um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the ways that we're responding? What are we, how are we able to then um, use that information to pivot with speed and with the, same, with the depth of complexity that is required? How do we understand um, the impact of our response or direct and indirect impact of our responses, both in time and space? And the third is the importance of a, an early listening system. And this really front and centers the importance of participation and equity. So when we talk about building trust, um, it's important to see that as a journey. Um, I like, um, as a science communicator called Dr. Seema Yasmin, who talked about um, access to data in communities as been see, seeing that as a way of building intellectual antibodies, which I really like because when we we all under, we understand how antibodies protect us now, and but we often rush to react and and to build that in the middle of the crisis. We have to do better than that. So building the trust both in the healthcare system, but importantly trust in science is really critical, not just for uptake of of. Um, of uh, developments like vaccines, but also to improve and increase the diversity and the participation in scientific research that is so needed to ensure results so that we have a generalizable. Um, so the last thing, very last thing I promise I would say is I just want to um, double down and I really appreciated the uh, that statement of the health in all policies um, statement that um, that Jonathan raised because I think that is really central to this. And, and in doing so, we have to recognize the health impact of, of any intervention across any sector. So we have a housing shortfall, sure. How are we building, how are we developing the urban spaces? How do we ensure that these houses that are being built are actually protecting health, creating health and not just creating disease down the line? Thinking about both the immediate and short-term impacts of, on health, the immediate and sustained, and the 
delayed and sustained. And those are things that we don't often see. And really critically, because you mentioned, you asked me to point out the important, the near and far um, implications on, 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 on health and on sustainability. So some of the work that we are, uh, when we're doing so, how does that impact us locally? And also how does that impact us globally? And very lastly, the importance of evaluating such interventions. When we talk about health and all policies, there is often an assumption that things just happen, but we know that health does not trickle down from good intentions. So we have to understand, and this, this highlights the role of science really in measuring, in understanding what are the impacts of integrating health in this way? What are the most impactful and most effective ways of building population health resilience through um, investing uh, in these systems of health across the, uh, across the board, recognizing the temporal and spatial or scales of impact that I mentioned earlier. So I'll, I'll stop there. I feel like I've spoken for far too long. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, to be there. Um, and Claire, do you want to come in next? Sure. Thank you very much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on this panel with you all. Um, can I just start by saying it's really refreshing to listen to a politician talk so much sense. And, uh, you know, I, I was nodding away to everything you were saying and going, Sounds like he's done his homework and he knows what he's talking about. This is a, you know, novel. So um, I really want to, you know, thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to pick up on some of the things you said in your plan and um, some of the, you know, key interventions that you think need to happen. And talk a bit about how we can actually address the real problems that have been exposed by COVID and look towards the broader global system to what already exists and how we can integrate rather than recreate the wheel because I think that's a key thing we need to move forward here. So the first thing I think is really important when we think about you know recreate you know uh, rethinking about new health policies or new ways of producing pandemic preparedness in future I think they have to address the real problems and I'm going to slightly disagree with one point you made Jonathan which is I think we do have the preparedness in this country to combat something like COVID if we have the political will to do so. I think if you look at other countries around the world, they have significantly less capacity uh, on the kind of, you know, uh, aggregate scale, but have been able to manage the outbreak much better than us. So I think the real problem, I mean, obviously we should build public health infrastructure for multiple reasons, as you and Tallulah have highlighted, but I think we have to tackle the real problem, which is what happens if you have the capacity but you don't have the political will there to drive it forward and to make those really difficult decisions at the early stage. And anyone who's worked in pandemics before, epidemics before knows that, you know, it's, it's early detection, rapid response is, is the key to managing any epidemic. So how do we get politicians to buy into that? And I think your, you know, your suggestion, for example, of, of germ games and, and simulations, I mean, I teach these all the time and I think they're vital. We've done it lots with students of showing that actually these things are as much political as they are public health focused. The decisions often are, how do you make these taboo trade-offs? How do you work out what's more important at each stage? And I think that's, that's vital, but I think we need to make sure we can somehow incorporate an analysis of, what, you know, when, we, when we do analysis of new emerging uh, threats, wherever they might be in the world, and you know, obviously you listed lots that, that we are concerned about globally. How do we take the political context into consideration as we make our risk assessment? You know, how can we say, okay, well, look, there's, a, there's, an, there's an emerging epidemic happening over there. Is that government going to move quickly? Are they going to be able to manage it? And, you know, there's been lots of discussion around things like the Global Health Security Index and different ways of measuring epidemic preparedness. And, and that's the key that they were missing, the political context in which these occurs. And I don't think it's any surprise that the countries that have done worst in this epidemic are those with, you know, um, divided political communities. So, you know, the US, Brazil, the UK, I think you can see a, a, key, a key trend there. And so taking that context into consideration is really important. The other thing I think is really important is we consider that a key problem, and again, talking about your discussion of a global alert system, we have global alert systems that through the World Health Organization, through the GOAR network, through um, the national reporting that WHO has to do, and through a range of non-governmental actors, ProMed Mail, Health Map, we know about outbreaks pretty quickly these days. I see the real problem isn't in knowing about it, it's about getting governments to do something when they do know about it. 
And, you know, how do we address that? How do we get governments to take these things seriously and follow WHO guidance? I mean, a lot's been said about this at this stage, you know, a year in. But the WHO produces amazing technical guidance and gives clear recommendations. And if governments choose not to follow it, that's on the governments. That's not on the WHO or on the system itself. But we have to tackle that real problem. A second key point I wanted to make is I think we really missed an opportunity here of ensuring as we improve scientific discovery and science as a cornerstone that, that both uh, Jonathan and Tallulah have highlighted, we need to integrate social science into this as well. I think this pandemic has shown us that social science is important, that you know pandemics affect societies, and so how do we make sure we can understand and preempt these things. The Ebola outbreak showed us the, the value and the importance of anthropologists. I think this has shown us the importance of sociologists, political scientists. So how do we make sure that when we start to develop pandemic preparedness plans and response plans in future, that we get that, that evidence and that experience at the start and they don't come further down the line. You know, it shouldn't have taken us five months to know that it was gonna be um, you know, minority ethnic groups who are going to be most affected. Any social scientist or public health professional could have told you that at the start. These things could be better integrated as we go along. And I think we also need to think about, you know, the suggestions you've got, for example, of ex external assessment and readiness. I think that's a great idea. And again, it sort of exists at the WHO. They have the international health regulations. Governments are required to, well, originally they were required to, to do a self-assessment of their current capacity to respond to pandemics uh, on an on a annual basis. That didn't really work so well because governments were saying they had 100% across the board when they didn't. It then moved to a joint external evaluation process where you kind of had a peer review uh, with another country around the world. And that has sort of worked a bit, but it hasn't been, uh, hasn't been up, you know, taken up by everyone because it's voluntary. I think we need to look at other surveillance mechanisms that exist in the world. I mean, the IMF has an amazing surveillance program under Article 4, where they have an annual review of macroeconomic capacity in each country. Why don't we have that for public health, right? And make it a compulsory thing that all member states with WHO have to do. That would then be an independent, rigorous analysis, which can be presented to governments, can be presented to WHO. But importantly, what has to come next after that is money to do something about it when you detect problems. One of the key problems we have with the WHO with being able to work globally in responding to pandemics is we can identify the problems and tell you what you should do, but if the money is not there to actually do it, then that's you know, a major gap. So we need to think more creatively about what we have in the global system, not reliant on, on necessarily governments, not reliant just on the public sector, on the private sector or the public sector, but thinking about how we can creatively and innovatively think about pandemic financing going forward. Um, I think there's you know, lots of red flags that can come with different mechanisms, but if we want to stop pandemics happening in this country, we've got to stop pandemics happening in every country. And to do that, we need to make sure there's sustainable financing globally at the point of an emerging pandemic that anyone can reach out to and get. Now we saw pandemic emergency financing facility from the World Bank in the wake of Ebola been a complete failure. Research I did at LSE, you know, we preempted it and we said this isn't going to pay out because the, the criteria is too stringent. So we need to think about new mechanisms, right? And, and how can we do that? And I welcome the introduction of a high level panel on pandemic financing that's going on at the moment to try and think about these issues. But we need to think about it here in the UK as well. How can we invest in you know, business continuity? You know, can we use money from insurance that comes in for business continuity as a pandemic preparedness pot, for example? Can we keep budget lines clear for this in some way? Uh, and I also think that just one last thing that you touched upon, which I think is really important, is this conversation about um, vaccine distribution and equity and access. And I think we're at a really critical point here. Uh, we know that the distribution of the vaccine is not fair. We knew it was always going to be unfair. There's been great efforts by, uh, by um, entities like COVAX to try and address that. But that's not enough. We need meaningful you know, release of IP, meaningful tech transfer, because that doesn't just stop the pandemic now, but building up capacity to be able to, to develop vaccines in countries all around the world will mean that next time this happens, we've got that capacity ready. And in the meantime, that capacity can be used for every other drug vaccine that needs to be produced for other people in the world. 
And I think that, you know, that that principle has to be applied and we should be doing what we can at the moment to supporting that process. I think I'm probably out of time, but um, I would love to hear all your thoughts on, the, on that. Thanks so much, Claire. Um, and finally, uh, we'll come on to Chris, who can talk to us about uh, some of the work that we've been doing here at IPPR as part of the Better Health and Care Programme on resilience and particularly relating to the NHS and social care systems. So Chris, over to you. Thanks, Harry. And fantastic to hear all the other contributions from, from the panellists and, and to be speaking amongst uh, such esteemed colleagues. So, so good to be here. Um, I just wanted to talk through uh, some IPPR research that, that we've been doing on, on the starting point, I suppose, for, for resilience and where we find ourselves, um, both in terms of at the outset of COVID-19, but also after COVID-19, thinking about how we go into the next decade. And the motivation for this is many of the things that, that Jonathan's talked about. So just that overarching decline in, in global health security. And I think um, pandemics, uh, the, the evidence on, on the growing risk of uh, emerging infectious disease and outbreaks is very clear. There's antimicrobial resistance to put into the mix. There's climate change, which is both a, a health disaster in its own right and an amplifier of other uh, health, health shocks. And there's, you know, in the non-infectious disease space, there's the aging population, there's the rise in chronic long-term conditions, there's the rise in multiple chronic long-term conditions. So that's the overarching context that we've been looking at resilience and the starting point that we have in the UK. And what we've essentially got and what I, what I wanted to ask um, people to do was just to reflect on, on where they were at the end of 2019, which is a bit of a, a cruel question because times were very different. Uh, we could go to the pub, I had shorter hair, and uh, what we see though at that point is that the seeds of, of the problems that we faced were, were already sown in many ways. So we've looked across this uh, as an international comparison as comprehensively as, as we can with the data that's there. And we see across almost all metrics, the, the UK lagging in terms of capacity and coming out of that decade of austerity with, um, with I suppose, things that had been defined as waste but that actually turned out to be quite important in terms of the kind of capacity and give us confidence uh, having been stripped back. So lots of the commentary is focused on beds and that's important. We, we, we saw that uh, occupancy levels in hospitals across the country were very high. So health service management tends to see 85% occupancy as a safe level that allows you to, uh, as a hospital manager, deal with uh, spikes in demand. Uh, four in five UK hospitals on the eve of COVID-19 had occupancy levels of 90% or more. So just a real lack of capacity. Now, that didn't necessarily interact with COVID-19 patients. What it did interact with was the discharge of patients into social care because there wasn't the confidence of coping with the pandemic and the disruptions that then came to cancer care, to heart disease care, to dementia care, all of which we know have been significantly disrupted by, by the pandemic so far and will continue to be so without action. Um, but of course, you can't uh, you can't do anything with a bed if you don't have a workforce. Um, and the workforce question uh, is is obviously very topical at the moment. But going in again to the pandemic, a decimated workforce in in the UK. We come very low down the rankings of uh, of international countries in terms of workforce size um, compared to the size of the population, the size of the NHS we have. So if we wanted, for example, the UK to have a health and care workforce in the top quarter of OECD countries. So the kind of place that you might expect a G7 nation that consistently prioritizes health and care to be at, then it's not 50,000 nurses or 40,000 nurses that we're talking about, it's 220,000 nurses. So just a huge shortfall um, to, to get to that kind of top, top level. Then there's a resource question beyond capacity. Uh, compared to the other G7 nations, even if you take out America as a country that does something a bit different in terms of spending lots of money on quite poor health outcomes, then the UK is uh, behind the amount of money, both for resource and for capital. Uh, we have less technology, MRI, CT machines for early diagnosis and less medicines. Uh, so medicines approved by NICE, a slower in uptake, quite remarkably slower in uptake in the UK than in comparative countries. And then as Claire, Tallulah, Jonathan, you've all mentioned the, the public health, population health question 
is incredibly important. So we see that we haven't managed to put life in life expectancy. We have on average two decades in below reasonable health. So living with the underlying health conditions that put us at risk of, of COVID-19, high inequalities. Um, and as has been mentioned, that comes down to direct cuts. So things like the cuts of the public health grant, which have predominantly been in the most deprived areas. It was no surprise to us to find that where COVID mortality was highest, the public health grant was cut around four times as, as severely. But it's also about all those other things, the social security net, the welfare um, system, housing, the things that have been mentioned. So what does that mean? Uh, well, for us, it means that there's, I suppose, three implications. The first is that we need to do something on that social security question. Um, there was a signpost from the budget, a budget during a pandemic that barely mentioned health or, or social care that there, there may be a move back to fixing the roof while the sun is shining narrative of, of, of austerity. That wouldn't be a very sensible decision. We need investment in people uh, and in welfare services and in safety net. Um, there's a question of how we meet some of these really stark global challenges. They're very difficult. We had remarkable successes. It was where, where, where the most successes came really was within the R&D science community that Claire, you mentioned, I think, targeting that infrastructure more proactively at global challenges, mission-based research at global challenges preemptively. That's, that's a really strong idea. But we also need to take the, the, the opportunity to stress test the system that we have. And that comes down to you know, taking the kind of approach that Barack Obama took in his 2009 Chicago uh, speech to, to stress testing the financial institutions. Well, we can do something similar in the UK and stress test the public health system as a whole. And that would mean putting in place the infrastructure for there to be um, reporting and political capital linked to not taking action on pandemics. IPPR's uh, policy recommendation for this is resilience rules or healthcare resilience rules borrowed from the fiscal rules that, that make very public the commitments and the approach of the government to managing the economy, in this case, the health system. Um, but infrastructure to make sure that there's accountability, transparency and reporting feels very important in the aftermath. Um, really excited to, to talk more and to go to the Q&A, but I'll wrap up my reflections there. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you to all our panellists for such a, a rich uh, set of opening remarks to, to start this conversation today. Um, we're now going to take questions from um, all of you guys on the on the uh, on the call on the event. Um, so please do put your questions in the Q and A function. We've got quite a few already. Um, if if you can see questions on there that you think are particularly important, then you can upvote them, and it'll be more likely that we get to them in the time we have remaining. Um, so I'm going to uh, take questions in threes and um, come to the panel to respond. Um, panelists don't feel the need to respond to all of them, just pick the ones that you think you can best respond to or think we need to spend more time on and hopefully across the four of you we cover most of the questions asked. So um, we've got a question from Richard which is what was learned from exercise sickness in 2016, what should we have learned, what was learned and what wasn't learned. Um, uh, a question from um, Martin about uh, directed to, to John. Um, uh, do we think uh, that we need effective protection improvement functions uh, for health uh, beyond the NHS and social care uh, that, that sit across government? So across departmental minister, across the departmental committee um, that, that, that promotes health across the whole of government. Um, and we have a question from Brennan, which is how can we ensure that the proposed reorganization of the NHS does not detract from the acute need to resolve the significant workforce crisis, the challenges of rehabilitation for people long COVID, and of course, the massive backlogs in delayed treatment. And IPR put out a paper yesterday showing um, the huge damage uh, to, in particular, patients with uh, facing stroke or heart attacks um, so unless we uh, uh, can, can catch up in terms of supporting people with other health conditions, there is going to be a massive health crisis even after uh, uh, we get to grips with the COVID crisis. So three questions there for our panellists. Um, maybe if I start with you, John, do you want to come in on, on any of those questions and perhaps particularly the question about uh, cross-government uh, intervention? 
I mean, yeah, thanks, Harry. I mean, absolutely. We definitely need this cross-party work. It's why uh, I strongly believe in the health in all policies approach and I'm committed to it. There's also a really, I didn't have a chance to talk about it in my speech because I was aware of time, but there's a really interesting piece of work that's been uh, uh, developed by uh, Dame Sally Davis and Jonathan uh, pearson Stuart, who are talking about a health index to measure health outcomes. And I think this is a really fascinating and exciting framework for how you can measure government interventions and make sure you are improving the health and well-being of the population. That is something that I would want to uh, uh, use as a yardstick if I were ever fortunate enough to become the nation's uh, health and social care secretary. Just one or two other reflections. I think we've all, all of us in different ways, have touched upon this issue as to how, we, and this, this speaks to the signet point, as to how you better prepare yourself as a country and ensure that there is the political will to make it happen. And I totally take Claire's point that uh, we, we lacked political will. And I put it in these terms, there has been lots of, over the years, lots of very interesting discussions and warnings about pandemics in the, in the, in the academic community and at um, in the international global health level. That debate has very rarely surfaced in Westminster. That's a weakness of our politics. I, you know, I don't say this with any sense of discourtesy or criticism of, of, of like the IPPR, because I am guilty of it in as much as we've been coming along to seminars and events talking about how do we deal with the growing burden of chronic disease? How do we be, deal with health inequalities? These are how do we improve um, uh, or rebuild the national health, so, I mean, social care. These are all really, really important debates. I'm not remotely demeaning any of those debates, not at all. But I think it is striking how little, how little pandemics has surfaced in the Westminster context, and that has to change. So I think the ideas of having um, uh, responsibilities at IMF level as part of Article Four is is really, really interesting because I think that will force governments to act. But if you can have a system as well where secretaries of state have to come to Westminster once to, once a year at least to report on pandemic preparedness, that will mean there is greater scrutiny and accountability. Uh, uh, in Westminster as well. And it is, and I love this phrase of, that Tallulah picked up on, about those intellectual antibodies. We have to have these learning systems in place and we have to be, we have to be engaging in this debate so we've got those intellectual antibodies. I think that's a great, great, uh, great phrase and I think you'll, you'll see it being used in my subsequent speeches and articles, uh, uh, Tallulah. Oh, Harry, I think you're on mute. The most commonly said thing on Zoom calls over the last year. Um, Tallulah, I think you had your hand up. Did you want to come in next on some of those questions? Yeah, it was just to pick up on the point that uh, Jonathan made about and, and, and that question around the uh, cross-departmental nature of, of health. Um, because it, it also links to my point about an early learning system. So learning is not just sort of what we've done, but what others are doing. Um, in some of the research that I've been doing around integrating health into human settlements policies outside of the UK, you know, some of the really, the, the, um, the barriers that keep coming up time and time again uh, relate to the governance mechanisms within different government um, uh, ministries um, or departments around accountability and uh, responsibility for health, right? So the, the housing budget is, is separate and has particular performance indicators that's got nothing to do with health um, it, in the spaces where, I, where I've done this. So thinking about um, health financing differently you know, there is healthcare financing, but there's also how we finance for population health and integrating accountability for health across every single um, uh, department is really critical, but also importantly in the public and private side of things, because there's a lot of interaction in that space. So who are we holding accountable to health, uh, for health? Um, accountable based on the impact of any intervention, but also accountability tied to the money. It really just has to be tied to the, to the financing um, point. And then I just wanted to pick up on, um, where was it, the other point? kind of gone down now. Um, 
Oh yes, uh, around um, um, uh, NHS type strategies. And, and again, this builds on the early uh, learning um, system that I talked about. What are things we knew already from um, other contexts that have experienced epidemics more frequently? We knew already that um, so if you look at the places, and Claire can maybe speak more to this as well, you know, places that have experienced the Ebola pandemic, there were more deaths from malaria and um, undernutrition and diarrhea than they were from Ebola. Why? Because we know that when we super, when we develop a response that is not cognizant of the, pop, the background population health need, that doesn't go away. And not only does it not go away, but people, because of the interventions and the public health control measures taken and the precarity of livelihoods and, and, and food security, et cetera, they actually can get worse. So we knew that already, right? So we have to ask ourselves in our, in our response and our, the way that we developed a COVID response, how did we integrate the pre-existing um, burden of, of, of disease um, and, the, and the healthcare delivery. How do we integrate that into our health interventions, into our messaging, et cetera? So that I think is the kind of thing that we know, um, that we knew beforehand. We also know from other contexts um, that I've worked in about the importance of community health workers, people on the ground who are Im immersed in their communities and over time have built trust and people are used to engaging with across different for different reasons, either under fives in terms of vaccinations or for you know other chronic diseases. We know and we've seen good examples from other countries that have tapped into those pre-existing uh, structures um, to, to really reach um, uh, um, different populations across the country. So, so those are some of the things that we could think differently about that, in, that integrating, integrating financing, but also integrating our, our response within the broader um, epidemiology of what we know um, um, exists in the country. And Claire, do you want to come in next? Thanks. I, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of the points raised and I guess the question. Um, uh, Jonathan, I completely agree with you that, you know, I, I work in global health and pandemic preparedness at the global level. And, you know, we've been talking about pandemics for, for decades and it hasn't been a conversation at the, at the UK level. And I think that speaks to, you know, what was wrong with the response in the first months, which was British exceptionalism. It's never going to happen here because we have the NHS and we're, you know, we've got this strong health system. And therefore, it's something that happens sort of over there. And I think that's, well, clearly the wrong way to look at it. But I think it's also something we have to readdress in the way we think about pandemics in this country. I think the fact that most of the um, funding for, for pandemic response comes from, well, now FCDO, but different and FCO rather than Department of Health, I think, is, you know, interesting. And I think we have to think about how we, uh, you know, as you've talked about this kind of whole society approach. But I think what we learned from the Operation Cygnus was that there's a gap between doing these exercises and then doing something about the findings, right? I mean, the, the exercise worked. It showed us where the gaps were. We didn't have enough ventilators. We didn't have enough, um, you know, didn't have a supply of PPE. But it's making governments accountable to then doing something about it. So this could feed back into um, Jonathan's suggestion of having a, a Secretary of State reporting on pandemic preparedness, right? Have you done what you needed to do as per the simulation? because the simulations only matter if something happens as a consequence of them. Um, I also just wanted to touch on what Tallulah was saying about the distortion of the health system. And again, I completely agree. To me, this is the thing that's perhaps the most inexcusable of this whole pandemic, which is we know that when, when in other crises, other health emergencies, the health system gets completely distorted and people die of things they don't need to die of because that's the only thing that people are focused on. And that's the only thing that donor money basically is focused on. And the fact that that's now happening here and there's been no learning, I think is really unforgivable. And, you know, we also haven't thought about the innovative ways to minimize some of this. Now, a lot of my work's in the gendered, out, uh, the gendered effects of health crises. We know, for example, that we've seen massive reductions in maternity service utilization as a consequence of COVID. Uh, we saw that during Ebola outbreaks, right? In DRC, what happened in 2019 during the Ebola outbreak when women were scared to go to hospitals for maternity services because they feared it was a location of disease transmission, they moved maternity services into disused schools, schools that were closed because of disease transmission. 
We just need to think about other ways of doing things to ensure continuity of care in a way which protects both the healthcare workforce, but also the, the users of the service to you know, continue trust building. Um, and let's not only kind of, again, let's, let's, let's break down this British exceptionalism and learn from other parts of the world that have had these experiences and have thought more innovatively or have learned what does and doesn't work. And I think only that is the way we can kind of move forward in this. And just finally, on the point about the community healthcare workers, absolutely, you know, they have been the bread bedrock of the response in many parts of the world, both to, you know, everyday health concerns and also the, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. But just a word of caution, which is that, you know, these, these are all women, almost exclusively, and are either unpaid or underpaid. So let's not perpetuate, you know, the absorption of free labor by women in responding to health crises and make sure that if we do, you know, pursue these different ways, we can think about fair ways of, of paying and recognizing that labor. Thanks, Claire. And Chris, um, do you want to come in and, and maybe particularly pick up on the, the question that has been answered on the NHS backlog and, and how we make sure that we both recover from COVID, but also recover from the, the indirect effects of COVID on our health and healthcare system? Yeah, I think it's a really important question. So um, two, two tidbits of, of IPPR research that, that, that come to mind here. One is that uh, August 2020, we uh, showed the kind of interaction between COVID-19 cancer care and demonstrated that five-year survival outcomes have, have gone back uh, a decade and don't look set to to recover without intervention so to, to to actively reclaim that that progress and to keep up with with what's possible in terms of the cancer outcomes and as harry's mentioned the the paper that we put out yesterday showing that um without again without intervention that there could be twelve thousand um more cases of, of heart attack and stroke than than expected over the next five years and this is just indicative really of of the kind of legacy that the COVID leads to normal care or to, to things that aren't COVID-19 after, after the vaccination programme finishes, for example. I think we probably know what we need to do um, in terms of the evidence being there and the, the policy base being there. It feels like there are three really core components. There's, um, and, and some of those are the things that, that I talked about in my, in my reflections. One is Capacity, there's a core capacity point here in terms of um, how quickly we can process a backlog and that comes down to how successful in the short term the government is in terms of uplifting capacity to do diagnostics, uh, either in hospital or in the community, bringing in um, workforce numbers um, that, that, that are relatively low um, and finding this, this is quite important, finding the people that did miss care whether that was a diagnosis or a screening or treatment during 2020 and um, doing outreach. I think we often have a tendency to sit there and hope people come and seek help. That's often not the best approach. So outreach, very important, um, I think. The second is social care. Um, we know that if the care system is functioning well um, and that if we have the right funding the right system in place that it relieves stress on the national health service so i think there's a really good case for short and long-term solutions to the social care problems that, that we face now for decades and the last is is on a similar note public health um, we know that prevention is better than cure uh, so where we can prevent um, either conditions in the first place primary prevention or things getting worse through better management of conditions where we can make those gains in the evidence base is quite good, but the investment and the commitment is not as strong, um, then I think we can be successful. There was a logic for this, wasn't there, in the, in the July obesity strategy. There was a sense, oh, maybe we want to get some prevention going from the government, but it was very isolated. Um, so it's almost a sense of, can we expand that logic to other areas like housing and uh, smoking and you know all the other determinants of health can we can we make the case for state intervention on those to to help people um the other one i just wanted to touch on was the um public uh, whether we need uh, action beyond the department of health and, and just to give strong agreement really with what others have said um i think it was very telling that when we last made progress on health inequalities in this country, it was from having prime ministerial buy-in to the issue. It was during the English health inequalities strategy, 97 to 2010, 
We also know that other instances of prime ministerial buy-in have been very important for other agendas, so the National Security Council, um, and one only needed to look to Theresa May's reaction to the uh, watering down of that council to see how important um, it was that, that an independent body chaired by the prime minister and with the right buy-in was, was there to, to, to facilitate cross-government action. So um, I think there's a very strong case for cabinet level, prime ministerial led action on health inequalities, public health prevention, pandemic preparedness from, um, from the aftermath of COVID. Um, but it does certainly need to be beyond the Department of Health and Social Care. Thank you um, everyone for, for those responses. I'm gonna take a, another round of, of questions. Um, so we have a question from David, um, which uh, I'm going to slightly uh, rephrase because it's quite long, but essentially is, is asking what have we learned about um, how we use technology in the UK to improve health, to manage health inequalities, um, reflecting on track and trace and uh, and the, the, the ability of other countries to, to set up uh, technological systems to manage some of this much more quickly. You know, what can we learn and, and how do we take that forward? Um, I have a question from uh, Richard Spicer, um, which is, did the implementation of the Lansley reorganisation and the creation of PHE in 2012 make us more or less resilient? And I guess a follow on from that is, is, is what do we want to see from the replacement to PHE in order to, to drive resilience in the health and care system? Um, and a question from, from Richard specifically for you, John, uh, which is, um, uh, if you were using uh, the health index approach or the health and all policies approach, uh, 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 what would you have expected to see at the recent budget? Uh, and what would, you, what, would you, what would you do differently? Um, so three questions there. Um, shall I come to you first, John, perhaps? Yeah. Um, so um, the, the final question and, and the Lansley point, well, I mean, I think the Lansley reorganisation of the NHS was uh, wasteful, uh, demoralising, um, uh, uh, distracting, and elements of it now are having to be unpicked as we said they would have to be unpicked at the time. Um, the IPPR have uh, um, made rep uh, published reports on this over in recent years, making uh, a similar point. I think exacerbating the problems of a fragmented system, uh, which is the last thing you need when you need to deliver whole person care to, to respond to this sort of growing burden of chronic illness was the years of underfunding as well, which, which has seen public health services have their budgets slashed over many, many years. We've seen, we've seen particular budgets uh, working with and supporting and helping some of the most vulnerable in society suffer from swinging cuts. Uh, drug and alcohol addiction services is a very good example. Um, mental health services um, have not been fully funded, properly funded either. And you have begun to see, before we went into this crisis, you have begun to see this emergence of this phenomena that, that has been seen for many years in the United States, which is this so-called deaths of despair phenomena, which is those in, which is increased mortality for those in middle age, essentially people uh, dying from a, from a combination of, or one of, um, uh, suicide, uh, alcohol abuse, or substance misuse. Um, and there are parts of the country where um, substance misuse is particularly problematic. I mean, um, usually coastal towns, um, areas like Blackpool, for example. Um, uh, 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 there's a lot, many different complex factors which are which determine health, uh, as, which is why you need this health and all policies approach. But you definitely don't want to see your public health budgets slashed back so severely as we have seen. So coming to the budget of last week, it was a hugely disappointing budget for health and social care services. Um, the public health allocations um, and public health funding cuts were not reversed for a start. The the actual investment in health and care services. Um, because they have an uplift for COVID care, is actually going to be reduced from April onwards, even though the pandemic doesn't end uh, on April the 1st, as far as I'm aware, it continues, uh, but their budgets are going to be reduced. And uh, they're cutting the pay of NHS staff. I mean, not only is that politically obnoxious, 
uh, or morally obnoxious to cut the pay of NHS staff in a pandemic, it's completely counterproductive given that we have uh, 100,000 vacancies across the NHS. This is only going to exacerbate the, the understaffing issues that we've had in the NHS and have had uh, uh, for many years. So um, uh, what would we have done differently? Well, we'd be, you know, a Labour government would be funding services properly, but you need to have a health and all policies approach as well. Uh, and, the, you know, the point I'm trying to make today is that pandemic preparedness isn't just about the important war game simulations and the investment in science uh, and the international working to prevent biodiversity loss and loss to deal with climate change. You also have to build a more resilient society by in investing in health and social care, but improving health outcomes. We should not be in a society where life expectancy is stalling and going backwards for the very poorest. That is an outrage. <laughs> And it has le left us exposed and vulnerable as well when this pandemic hit. Thanks, John. I couldn't agree, couldn't agree more with you on that. Um, Claire or Tallulah, who wants to come and gra grapple some of the other questions that were asked there? Who'd like to come next? Um, I can come on quickly on the one about technology. Um, I, and this is not my you know area of expertise, but from what I can tell, you know, we 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 again try to do it alone with this technology thing and with track and trace to our detriment. And I think there's two points there. One is, again, let's look to where it's working and, you know, use those systems. If there were already functioning systems in South Korea in the start of February, why weren't we just simply licensing those rather than thinking we had to make our own, which then didn't work. But I think it's not just about technology as, as, a, as a tool. I think coming alongside the technology, we really have to improve our, our public communication and risk communication with why we're using this, because the best tools in the world aren't going to work if people don't understand it. And there's been a lot of, um, you know, uh, uh, now social science research basically showing that even if, you know, even when people have the track and trace app or whatever it is, they're just not, they're not downloading it, right? They're not logging onto it because they don't want to be caught by it. And so you have to, you know, teach people that these, these, these interventions aren't designed to penalize, they're designed to save and protect. And that didn't come alongside the technology. And I think that was a, a real gap in the way we think about it. And I also don't think we should think about this as a, as a one-off. Uh, you know, I think the next thing that's gonna be a technology question is this conversation about vaccine passports, which is becoming very live. And um, I think there's gonna be questions around how we're gonna do this. Are we gonna have a, a, you know, an app form for that as well, or some sort of digital tracking? Do we have that technology in place and have we communicated to people this, this might be a reality in a way which gets through to them and is meaningful in the way it's communicated? Yeah, just, just to add to that, you know, along one of the challenges of, of not using the track and trace app is that if, if the consequence of using it is that you lose your livelihood and you can't pay the bills, then people aren't going to use it. And so you need a proper welfare system in place, otherwise, um, there is a massive disincentive for people to use it and we've seen that in the UK and other countries have been much more generous and much quicker at setting up systems to help people manage this, this, this crisis. So, um, Tallulah, do you want to come in next? Yes, I just want to touch on, I realise we're running out of time, um, the issue of, of um, a public health system and, and public health England, not necessarily to talk about the structure of the PHE or the new, um, what, what will be, but just to highlight things I think would be critical, which I think was the tail end of that question. And I think there are two things. One in a, is a uh, and decentralization and connection to the local. You know, I talked about this, this before, you know, if we're thinking about preparedness as, as, as preparedness response learning and, and listening all early, we absolutely have to capacitate and build that network of local uh, public health um, that is connected on the ground because that will serve as well for picking things up early. Um, and the second thing I think is really critical is to ensure that we're not separating or siloing the um, strategy of response to pandemic and the building of, 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 res of resilience, because we know that these things are connected. Right, so we, we see how the pandemic is playing out. And the reason we're talking about resilience in this context is because we know there's the differential exposures and vulnerabilities and access, et cetera. So 
it'd be, a, I think, a vital, a crucial error. Um, PHE, the moment, for example, are doing really like important work on healthy places and, and working with urban planning and integrating health into those spaces. It's a really critical aspect of resilience. The question is, can we think about how to better integrate that? You know, there are things that we, the the scourge of childhood childhood hunger, the the injustice of air pollution that is the people are breathing air in in London in the 21st century in some parts of London that that cause um, cause death of children. You know, it's just the, the embarrassment of of homelessness, not just not just uh, plain but hidden. These are certain. These are these are critical. These are fundamental cracks in our resilience, right? And it's really critical that we don't separate that from, from pandemic preparedness. So we need to make sure that we're doing both, but that they're speaking to each other and they're suitably localized. And Chris, um, do you wanna come in last but not least? Some, some last words. So um, on, the, on the technology point, um, I, I couldn't agree more with what's been said. I'll share from the, the staff perspective, because we, um, when, when the transition to digital was happening in the first peak of, of COVID, we asked um, general practitioners what, what was underpinning the shift to, um, to digital first, to technology, and, and how had it happened so quickly? Um, and how could we take that learning into technology, something we talk about trying to spread quite a lot in pre-COVID times, so how could we take that forward? And the lessons that they shared with us were that they felt that there had been a sense of purpose put in place. So COVID creates that sense of purpose and it's, it's cohesive. Um, there'd been guidance and permission from the center, a little bit of resource, and most importantly, this edifice of preventing people from changing practices, adopting innovation, doing what they think works for their local population health system that had been brought down, albeit temporarily, through the pandemic. So there was there was much more freedom to go out and do things and much less intervention from the center, which is often, frankly, put in place to install the, the, the kind of short-term cost efficiency point that, that I referred to earlier. So I think if we can take that lesson out in terms of technology implementation, combine it with what's been said around communicating that properly and public awareness and, and learning, then I think that's a good thing to do and a, and a site that we can take the build back better rhetoric properly into practice. So I think that's important. Um, I'll leave it on the technology point for time, Harry, but... Um... Great, thank you. Harry, um, can, I just, can I just, Harry, can I just throw something in? The other thing that we've not really touched upon in the discussion, it's been an excellent discussion, and thank you to, to, to Claire and to Lula and, and Chris, is that uh, we can do so much more if we can get agreements around data sharing both at an international level and a local level and making sure the right people have access to data. Throughout this crisis, I've spoken to directors of the public health who couldn't get access uh, to data. And as one of them put it to me, uh, uh, if this had been the time of uh, 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 Jon Snow trying to identify the, uh, where, where the cholera outbreak uh, came from, he wouldn't have been able to identify the water pump because he wouldn't have been allowed to get the data uh, for so long. And I, we really need to think, get better systems in place to make sure we are sharing data and the right health practitioners are getting hold of it. Thanks, John. Um, so I'm going to wrap us up uh, now. We don't have quite enough time for another round of questions, I don't think. Um, it's been a fantastic discussion. Um, thank you to all of our speakers, first of all, to, to, to Jonathan Ashworth, uh, to Claire, to Tallulah, and of course to Chris. Um, thank you to our events team for helping organise all of today's uh, uh, discussion. And thank you to everyone here for attending. And the final thank you to our sponsors for the Better Health and Care programme, our founding sponsors, um, Gilead, AstraZeneca, GSK and Siemens. Um, without their support, we can't do things like this. So, so thank you to them. And um, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Uh, we've got a whole host of events coming up in the future. So uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, thank you, everybody, and have a good day.